So let's have a look at the analysis of the running time of quicksort. Suppose we have an input of size n, and cn is the number of comparisons taken, then we get some kind of recurrence that looks roughly like this. I'll explain in a second what this is. Here, if the pivot element ends up in position p, we don't know what that is a priori, just ends up wherever it ends up, then we have a left and a right sublist, and they have sizes p minus 1 and n minus p, respectively, so we have to sort those recursively. Hall's partition method takes about that many comparisons, n minus 1, in order to get the pivot in its correct place. So this gives you a reasonable description recursively of the running time, except for the fact that the pivot could end up anywhere. Now in the worst case, the pivot ends up just where it started, at the first position or maybe at the other end. You're going to get something like that. All you'll have done is done a lot of work in order to put the pivot in a fairly obvious position, and then you just reduce the input size by one. You still have a very large left or right sublist, and the other one's empty, but that's no consolation. There's still a lot of work to do. It's very easy to see that if your input is structured so that you get the worst case every time recursively all the way down, you're going to get runtime which is of order n squared. You're basically adding an n minus 1 and n minus 2 all the way down. So the question is, what happens in the average case? It's very unclear even what the best case for quicksort is, so it's hard to know what to guess here. But we'd hope that the average case is somehow better and the worst case. Somehow, intuitively, we think, well, the pivot's going to be kind of close to the middle, or at least equally distributed along there, and maybe when it's near the middle, we get a nice even split, which is kind of like merge sort, which gives us n log n, so maybe we have a chance of doing better than n squared. Let's see what happens. So let's have a look at the average case running time of quicksort. We're only going to consider the case where all the data items are different, and they might as well just be the numbers 1 to n in some order. So we consider some input being uh, a permutation of the integers 1 to n. And we're just going to measure the number of comparisons taken. Of course, we also have to do some data moves or exchanges. It turns out that those are fewer in number, and comparisons are really dominating in most cases. So we already know that we do order n squared in the worst case. What are we going to do on average if we have a randomly chosen permutation as input? Now remember, we have something like this as our recursion describing the number of comparisons. when n is bigger than 1, and of course c1, when you have input of size 1, you have no comparisons. p is the position that the pivot ends up in. Now, if we choose a permutation uniformly at random, so every one of them has equal probability, namely 1 over n factorial, as input, then what can we say about the pivot? Now, if you're lucky, the pivot goes right in the middle and all the way down the recursion. That would be extremely lucky. Then you'd get something like merge sort and you'd get n log n as the answer. But we know that we can get n squared in the worst case. So is a typical case closer to the worst or the best? Or the, who knows, right? We don't really know until we analyze this. So this. Recursion depends on where the pivot ends up, but that depends on 
what the input permutation was. Once you choose the input to deterministic algorithm, the pivot ends up somewhere. Right? We're looking at the case here, remember, where the pivot is always the first element of the list. So let's let a n be the expected value, the mean, of the number of comparisons over all possible inputs. What can we say now about this recursion and can we derive a recursion for a n which is similar? Well, actually we can. Because think about this. Permutations are equally likely to be chosen the pivot is the first element, that's equally likely to be any of the numbers 1 to n with equal probability. So the probability that the pivot ends up in any given place is the same, namely 1 over n. So first you have n minus 1 comparisons for sure, no matter what the input. Now with probability 1 over n, the pivot gets in position i, let's say, from 1 to n. And then given that the pivot is in position i, what is the number of comparisons that need to be done? Well, the point is that once you've put the pivot in, because you had a uniformly, randomly chosen permutation, when you stick the pivot in its correct position, we then do the recursive call on the two sublists. The key thing is that those sublists, the relative order of the elements in there, is uniformly likely to be any given permutation of the inputs. In other words, everything occurs uniformly at random, and so we have the same probability distribution on the left and the right sublists that we did on the input, and so we can use that in the recursion, and basically the expected value here is if the pivot ends in position i, then it's i minus 1, okay, and otherwise you have n minus i, and we can simply Do that, because i is ranging over all possible values where the pivot can get in. This is the probability that the pivot ends in position i. For each i, this is the expected number of comparisons you do in the recursive calls. We can tidy that up, because if you look at i equals 1 here, you get a0 plus a n minus 1. If you look at i equals n, you get a n minus 1 plus a0. And in fact, that happens for all of them. Every term occurs twice in that sum. So I can simplify like that. And we go from 0 to n minus 1, so let's just tidy that up as well. This is exactly what we were looking for. We've got a recurrence which relates a n to previous values there. It's quite a bit more tricky than the ones we've seen in the recurrence lecture because here it's what's called a full history recurrence. The value at n depends explicitly on all the previous values, not just, say, two of them as in the case of the Fibonacci numbers or something like that. However, turns out that we can say something about this, and in fact, with a little bit of trickery, we can solve it completely. So the average or expected number of comparisons satisfies this interesting recurrence. This is not easily solved just by using the simple methods that we talked about in the recurrence lecture. We need to go a little bit deeper here with a few 
transformations before we can get it into that form. The first thing we do is reasonably obvious. We multiply through by n because we don't really want to have fractions in there. That's a good general procedure. And so we get this expression here. Now the idea is we see this sum here and we think what happens if we do the same thing but with n replaced by n minus 1? Maybe we can subtract off some stuff here, telescoping kind of idea. So let's try that. If we plug in n minus 1 here, we get that. Now subtracting the two, we get a reasonably nice expression because we only get two times the top term here. And here we've got a common factor of n minus 1 and then the difference between the other two which is just 2. Now, now rewriting this we get that a n a n is equal to, taking that to the other side, n plus 1, a n minus 1, plus 2 times n minus 1. That's our basic occurrence there. Now, we would like to be able to iterate this, but it's still not quite in the right form. What we really want is to be able to change variable by saying b n is n times a n. That doesn't quite work, because then there's an n plus 1 and an n minus 1 here. So the sneakier trick that we do is we divide through by n times n plus 1 purely because it then makes the indices match up nicely. You get a slightly messy expression on the right here. However, you have this nice thing here and that this is a something we can call say bn and this will equal bn minus 1. All right? The indices match up properly. In other words, we can write bn is bn minus 1 plus this expression here. Now I'm looking ahead here a little bit, but what I want to do, this is a known function over here. What I want to do then is say bn minus 1 is bn minus 2 plus some other slightly different thing. Go all the way down, telescoping to the bottom, and get bn in terms of b1 plus a whole sum of things. Since I'm going to take a sum of things, I want to simplify these in a way that will help my summation. So I'm going to first do partial fraction expansion on this. So we know from general theory that it's going to look like that. Some sum of things. We're going to have some constant here and some constant here. I need 2n minus 2 on the top when I multiply them through. I think the way to do that is going to be like this. That's going to give me 2n minus 2 on the top when I cross multiply. That's correct. So now I have this nice expression, and this is true for all n greater than 1. So what I will do is iterate that, and I'm going to get bn equals, it's going to equal this, bn minus 1, I'll do one more step, bn minus 1 is going to be bn minus 2, plus some same thing with n replaced by n minus 1. And I feed it in and do the telescoping. In the end, I'm going to get Bn is equal to B1 plus some sum of stuff uh, minus some sum of some other things. And where's the sum going to go from? From Here, you, have, you get one term every time you go down. So you're going to get either n or n minus 1. Let's fix it up in a minute. 
the positive one here is 4 over i plus 1 and here it's going to be minus 2 over i I guess bn gives me the first term here it gives me the n term then the last thing I do is b2 and so here I'm going to get equals 2 so it's a sum from 2 to n actually it turns out and this will also be a sum from 2 to n It's not really that important whether it's 1 or 2, that's not going to make a difference to the asymptotic running time, but we'll just try and get it precise. Now B1 is A1 over 2, A1 is 0, so that's just 0. And this is 4 times a third plus a quarter plus plus one over n plus one minus two times a half plus a third plus plus one over n plus one uh, plus n and there's a bit of simplification and you get four times 1 over n plus 1 here and then here you get minus 1 which comes from this term and everything else is going to cancel the 4 and the 2 so you get a 2 times the sum i equals 3 to n of 1 over i and as I said a minus 1. Now if we remember the harmonic number which is the sum from 1 to n of 1 over i we can write this as follows that's the harmonic number Hn minus the first two terms, so it's 1 plus a half and then I get the minus 1. That minus is like that. Taking away the first two terms And so that equals 2 times Hn plus 4 over n plus 1 minus 4. And therefore An, which is n plus 1 times Bn, that's 2 times n plus 1 times Hn plus 4 minus 4 times n plus 1 which is 2 n plus 1 hn minus 4 n and that's the best answer we're going to get for the average case running time now the key thing to notice is that hn is the sum of the first n reciprocals it grows like log n. If you remember the way we did integral approximation to get asymptotics, this can be done similarly to the example with the logs that we did. And in fact, you get that hn is order of log n, and therefore an, because this is smaller, the leading term is of order n log n in here. So there was quite a lot of calculation there, but the long and the short of it is that we have shown that quicksort on average runs reasonably quickly.